All right, well, welcome everybody. This is Barney Kunze, and we are back again for another weekly coaching call. Um, this one is particularly uh, interesting. It's actually unique, um, not only because this is, I think, uh, around 32, um, number 32 or number 31 that we've been doing consistently. Um, of course, there's been a couple that we've had some hiccups with. Uh, schedules and all that, but this is the first pre um, weekly coaching call that we're doing with a new presenter for our round two for the Animal Wellness Summit 2018 for our second annual event. Uh, up until now, if you've been kind of following along as a VIP or if you have came across all of the calls as a recording and you've been listening through um, as all of them, we've been predominantly having the majority of our presenters on who have presented in the first year of 2017. And the goal of these calls originally were for um, our VIPs, and now we've had uh, so much value that has kind of grown out of these calls that we're opening them up so that everybody um, can take part in them. And the presenter that we have today um, is Dr. Judy Morgan, and her uh, uh, entry into the Animal Wellness Summit, she's bringing two presentations. Um, so Dr. Judy, I would like to say welcome and thank you at the same time for joining me today. No problem, thank you. Awesome. Um, so can you tell us just, um, because I don't know that much about you myself, um, yet and based on other, what I've read through and watched and listened with your presentations, but could you just give us a bit of a, a brief overview, um, as to like your story, like who you are, your background and where you are right now, because your presentation topics are very interesting and we'll get, we'll get into those right after, um, your brief little uh, story. Okay. Okay. So I am a holistic and integrative veterinarian in New Jersey. I graduated from veterinary school as a very traditional veterinarian back in the mid 1980s. And so we didn't even talk about any alternative medicine back then. And I went to a Midwest US school. So very, very, very <laughs> traditional. And about 10 years into my career, I was getting very frustrated with chronic disease and things that, you know, I didn't have any more tools in my toolbox. I didn't have good answers. So I started on a journey to try to find other things that I could offer and, um, you know, really look at healing the body from within instead of just always putting a Band-Aid on with medications or prescription diets. And that journey um, went down a kind of a winding path and I investigated a lot of alternative healing methods. But what really spoke to me was traditional Chinese veterinary medicine in particular food therapy. So the four branches of Chinese medicine are acupuncture, which everybody's pretty familiar with, herbs, something called Tui Na, which is kind of a combination between massage, acupressure, and chiropractic, and food therapy. And to me, food therapy just jumped out, grabbed hold, and said, this is what you are meant to do, and it's what I'm passionate about. So I am a best-selling author. I have four books that I've published. Uh, the latest one was Yin and Yang Nutrition for Dogs, which is a cookbook using traditional Chinese veterinary medicine principles. And... Um, you know, for me in my practice, about 75 to 80 percent of the healing that I do is done with using whole foods. And so food is very, very powerful. We don't realize that the effect uh, food has on our bodies, on our pets' bodies. And so that's what I teach. And I'm a pet advocate this year. I am one of the top five finalists in the Women in the Pet Industry Network um, as a pet advocate. So my platform is, you know, my Facebook, all my social media is really all about educating pet owners to be their own pets advocate and really explain to people, you know, the ways that we can keep our pets healthy. Um, so we did that through the Truth About Pet Cancer series. We do that through social media. We do that through the books. Um, so that's really who I am. I'm a pet advocate trying to educate pet owners um, so that their pets can stay with them longer and live happy, healthy lives. Well, that's really cool. And your book, I think, is sitting on your bookshelf behind you there, right? Uh, there's one that? over the left shoulder. That one right there was the first one, Needles to Natural. And this and then one right there, this is hard to do, yeah. uh, is the Yin and Yang <laughs> Nutrition for Dogs. And there's a couple others. <laughs> no, that's really cool. Um, so, it, and it is unique. It is where um, food, as the, I forget, is, was it Hippocrates that said, let thy food be the medicine and let thy medicine be thy food. Exactly. Um, 
And I think that, so from my, my experience, I relate this a lot to um, with my, and, and first and foremost, just so you know, I'm not an animal expert. I am in my own experience with the animals that I grew up with and have in my life um, right now, but I am in the community building um, realm. And, um, and I'm, I've always interested in all of the presenters and their story. And there's always usually, there's always a story. I mean, we all have our own stories, but uh, mine is in the human world. Um, and I use at a surface level, never got into traditional Chinese uh, medicine, but it's just interesting, not only applying it to humans, but um, then applying that to animals. Yep. Um, and so the, you, the two that you're going to be doing are uh, feeding according to TCV, TCVM, which is traditional Chinese veterinary medicine, correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, energetics for maximum health. And the second one is TCBM food therapy for kidney disease. Um, so I think it's probably a silly question, but like, why did you pick those two topics? Um, and <laughs> why don't we start, why don't we start with one and then just talk a little bit more about them because okay. I feel like there's a lot there. Yeah. So the, uh, TCVM principles according to energetics, that's kind of the basis of all food therapy. And so when we're talking about energetics, we're talking about the yin and the yang, the two um, opposite yet um, complementary uh, parts of life. So yin is the cooling, moisturizing part of our life and yang is, and that's kind of the slower, you know, mellow, that's the female side. Um, and then the yang is the hot, energetic male, you know, bright, so that's the summer side of life. And it's so important for people to understand that we can change our pets' personalities. We can change um, their food according to the seasons. We can change their food um, according to you know their environment, to, according to illness. And if we understand the energetics of yin and yang and how they have to interplay together and how we keep those in balance at all times. So when you look at the little Chinese yin and yang symbol there's a, kind of a white comma with a black dot and a black comma with a white dot and they fit together like a puzzle piece and the white is within the black the black is within the white because you can never have all of one or all of the other um, all females make male hormones all males make female hormones because you always have to have that balance and it's when things get out of balance and we have too much of one or too much of the other that's when everything breaks loose and we develop disease and we develop cancers and we develop, um, you know, a lot of the problems that we see with our pets. So it's all a matter of balance. So that first lecture about energetics is how to balance things out, how to tell if your pet is too much one way or the other, and then what foods you can use to get them back into balance. Yeah, that's cool. So why don't you, could you, enlighten us with your uh, wise words of wisdom and give us a practical example. Like I'm thinking about my dog who unfortunately has, uh, she got really sick and we had to clean up the room. And I didn't mention this a whole lot in our community, but it's still, um, she ran away. She take off, she took off. I don't know what she wasn't feeling good, obviously. And we've been looking for her and she's been gone for three weeks. And so um, it's really sad, but yes. it's as uh, one of the presenters, I think uh, Dr. Well, pardon me, not Dr. But Brent Atwater uh, said, she's like, the, well, most of us are going to outlive our pets and we don't yes. we always want to face that reality until it happens. And it totally blindsided us. Cause I was like, Oh, Lucy's our young little nice dog. She's always going to be here. And the reason I'm saying this is not to distract, but to, kind of give some context to my question to you okay. is that um, when I'm thinking about our dog, Lucy, I've noticed the differences in her um, in the summer and the winter. And so what you were just saying about the, you know, changing the foods that we can feed our pets during the different seasons um, based on what we notice and what we can see in them. Um, can you, if what I'm saying is making sense, can you give us a basic uh, really sure. good example for that? Sure. So I, I have a great example. We happen to have seven rescue dogs that are all teenagers. Well, the newest one is only six, but everybody else, they're teenagers, as in 15, 16, 17 year old. Um, one of our cats is just about to turn 19. And so we were on vacation for a month. We actually had a pet sitter for an entire month for this 
crowd of crazies. And uh, when we came home, well, before we left, our oldest cocker, who will be 17 next month, um, I, before we left, I noticed that her tongue was a darker red than normal and she was panting more than normal. So I kind of said, oh, you know, that means there's heat somewhere in this dog. And heat, when, uh, you know, when it shows up suddenly without a weather change, is probably due to inflammation somewhere. So in my mind, I'm thinking, all right, this dog's got an inflammatory process going on because her tongue is darker red than normal. She's panting more than normal. She's drinking a little bit more than normal. So there's something going on, and I need to get to the bottom of it. So when we got back from our trip, walked in. The first thing everybody tells me is this dog is peeing 10 times more than she used to and she's having accidents in the house and she's always been really very good. So, you know, those were signals to me that there's some sort of internal heat in this dog. She's drinking more, trying to put out the fire, which obviously then makes her have to pee more because it's got to go somewhere. Her tongue is dark red um, and she's panting. And so dogs don't sweat. The only way they can get rid of their heat is to pant more. So those are all clues to me that this dog has internal heat somewhere. So took her into the clinic, ran lab work, perfectly normal. So I'm thinking, yes, we got this. And then we did x-rays and she probably has 20 tumors in her chest. And the biggest one is bigger than her heart. And then all these smaller ones. So, you know, if I had just done kind of the routine that everybody does is, oh, well, you know, I've got this 17 year old dog. She's peeing more than usual. Let me check a urine sample or let me check some lab work. Well, her kidneys are fine. Okay. It's all good. But because I know about the energetics and because her energetics were telling me this dog is very hot, I kept looking and finding those tumors in her chest while devastating sure explains her symptoms. Yes. That's a very hot, cancer is a hot inflammatory process that we have going on in this dog. So she's going to be 17 next month. So I'm not rushing her into chemo and radiation. I don't really like to go that route with my animals. I do everything as naturally as possible. So um, we changed up her diet a little bit and we started adding foods that are going to help cool her body. So all the food that we eat has an energetic. So it's either going to warm us or cool us. So a typical example of that, think about when you eat like a spicy Indian food. It's got a lot of pepper, it's, you know, peppers in it, it's got curry, it makes you sweat. So that is energetically warming your body from the inside. So that, you know, that's pretty easy to imagine, you know, your nose runs and you, so then your body's like, oh my gosh, I got to cool off. So what does it does? It makes fluid. What does it do? It makes fluid. So the fluids are draining out of your nose and you're drinking water. And so, you know, all of a sudden you're kind of like the dog trying to put out the fire. It's like, oh, I got to drink more. Um, and one of the things that you might grab for, if you're somebody who is one of those, you know, hot pepper tasters, you're going to grab a glass of milk because milk is cooling and milk is soothing. So that's the opposite energetic. When you're really hot in the summer, what do you grab? You grab ice cream, you grab watermelon. Those are foods that are inherently cooling to the body. So I can tweak my dog's diet and add more cooling ingredients, remove warming ingredients, and try to help cool her while we're you know, using herbs and acupuncture and other things to try to at least keep the cancer from you know, really taking over, although it's done a pretty good job already. Um, but the dog is acting perfectly normal. So the great thing about our pets is you know, they can have a, a terminal illness. They don't realize it. You know, maybe they feel kind of eh. Maybe she doesn't feel her best, but I can open the door and throw the Frisbee and that dog takes off after it. She's running up and down the stairs. She'll be 17 next month. One of the problems with people is that we project our feelings and we project like, you know, I know the dog's got a, a terminal illness. So, you know, what I'd like to do is curl up with the dog and give her a big hug and cry my eyeballs out all day. But then the dog's looking at me like, why are we sad? I don't understand why we're sad. So, you know, it's really up to us to take the lead from them and say, well, okay, I'm going to support you in your journey and you're happy. So what's on your bucket list? Oh, you want to go for a walk? Okay. You want to go play Frisbee? Okay. I mean, we'll keep it obviously to a minimum because she doesn't breathe as well as she used to. Um, but so for me, it's all about quality of life, not necessarily quantity, although my dogs are living to be 17. So I'm pretty happy. Um, 
so that's how we use food to try to modify what's going on in their life. So if you have, uh, so we see a lot of dogs, Cushing's disease is one of the biggest endocrine problems, endocrine disorders that we're seeing, uh, partly because there's so many endo endocrine disruptors in the food channels in our environment. So we're seeing a lot of problems with you know thyroid disease, adrenal gland disease, pituitary gland disease. But one of the main, well, two of the main symptoms that we see in dogs with Cushing's disease is excess panting. So people come in and they complain, my dog is keeping me up all night panting. The dog is just really uncomfortable. They're pacing around the room. They're going to lie on the bathroom floor. Um, they're drinking. They're urinating more than usual. And those are all symptoms that your dog just has internal heat. So we change the diet around. We start cooling them off. And presto changeo, we have a dog that's not panting as much, not drinking as much, and we haven't even touched a drug yet. So that's why I think this is so important because if I can put off or eliminate the use of drugs that are going to have potentially disastrous side effects, that's so much more important to me. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an obvious one um, in the outcome. I think that the challenge that I've noticed myself personally, but also a lot of the questions that get asked, Dr. Judy, is that the inability for the average person to identify those <clears throat> those issues or those challenges and then or even if they're uh, identifying that like oh well my dog's overheating and hot they've got some inflammation issues but then to know what to do to kind of balance it out right right i mean inherently inherently to me i listen to you talk as a holistic health uh, educator and professional in 14 years in the human world uh, that makes sense but on the other hand if it was lucy and my own dog, it's funny how sometimes I'm like, well, I don't know if I would know what to do. <laughs> right. You know, you, because it's, you don't. it becomes your own. Yeah. You don't. And if you talk to your, your traditional practitioner, they're kind of, you know, the, you know, here's a prescription diet that you, that they'll prescribe, which is generally completely wrong as far as the energetics go. Um, and, and they don't understand it either. I mean, it's a small subset of us that understand this. And that's why I write the books, because it makes it a little bit easier. So particularly in this last book, The Yin and Yang Nutrition, um, you know, it's got charts in there for, you know, okay, my dog has these symptoms. He's drinking more. He's panting more. He's, you know, looking for the cold tile floor. He loves going outside and playing in a blizzard. But yet, you know, as soon as the temperature gets above 70, he's panting and he can't stand going outside. So we have, you know, all those things listed for people, and that's part of what is covered in my seminar on the summit. Um, you know, things to look for. How can you tell? Is my dog too hot? Is my dog too cold? And remember, there's still some yin in the yang and some yang in the yin. So your dog is not going to have 100% all hot or 100% all cold. He's going to have some from each category, and then you have right. to look at it and say, well, I've got six in this column and three in this column. I'm going to go with this one. Um, right. And then we give you the lists of all the foods. And so in my seminar and in the books, we have the list. These are the ones that are energetically cooling. These are the ones that are energetically warming. So it doesn't mean that you have to now suddenly become a chef and design right. all the meals for your pet. I mean, I've got recipes, so they're already designed. You can just you know follow the recipe. Or you can say, well, hey, I've been feeding my dog lamb and rice kibble. Lamb and rice are both energetically very hot. I've got a dog who is panting, drinking a ton, can't, you know, loves the blizzard. It's like, all right, well, I can just switch from a lamb and rice kibble to a fish. If I use an ocean fish kibble, I now took my energetics from way up here at hot to way down here at cooling. And all I did was change bags that I bought in the grocery store or online or wherever you buy your, you know, pet store. Um, right. So it can be that simple. And, and so before I really got into designing my own diets and understanding, you know, at the depth and the level that I do now, um, I remember my, my office staff would come in and they'd have a new puppy and they'd be feeding it, you know, lamb and rice puppy food. And I'm like, oh my God, this dog won't get house trained. I tell him to sit and it's like, sit, 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 sit. And the dog's not listening. And I think he's just dumb and he's untrainable. And I'm like, hmm, well, instead of feeding that lamb and rice kibble, maybe we should look for a turkey base or a beef base or a fish base. Let's just cool them down a little bit. They make right. the change. Two weeks later, they come in and go, huh, house trained and listens. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, and, it, and, it, and I think that's where what I was kind of getting at before earlier, where 
it's learning, knowing what to do <clears throat> and then doing it, but then having the guidance um, to, to have some reference. So whether it be uh, getting your book or, and or both listening to the presentation, um, it sounds really exciting. Uh, right. Because that was, that was one of the part where, um, so you're mentioning kibble. Now, why do you feel that feeding real food to pets is so important? Um, oh. So the pet food industry has kind of gone down the tubes. Um, you know, years ago when uh, pet food, you know, first, you know, the ease of feeding something that was pre-made, you know, this goes back to the same problems that we have with feeding ourselves. You know, when we all lived on the farm and we raised our own food or we bought, you know, fresh veggies from the farmer next door and we supplied the meat from our farm or whatever, everybody was eating fresh foods and our pets were feeding the leftovers of all that fresh food. We didn't have near as many problems with cancers and endocrine disease and chronic inflammation, you know, arthritis, all the problems that we have now. Part of the problem for both people and for our pets is we've become a society of convenience. And so we don't want to do any more work than popping open the box or the bag or the can and, you know, for ourselves heating it up. Uh, it's kind of funny. My mom, they, my parents live with us now, so my husband does all the cooking. My mom, for years, everything was always fresh food, you know, and that's what we always ate. And then, you know, she started teaching full time and suddenly, food became much more processed, particularly during the week. It was like, what can I pull out of the freezer that's already pre-made and all I have to do is warm it up? And so I like to call the processed food, processed food-like substance, because it's not real food anymore. Um, it's really interesting when you go to the store and you buy um, some of these dog treats, uh, you know, two that come to mind are like bacon and strips and sausages. And you look at it and you're like, oh, that's bacon. Oh, that's sausage. Except when you read the ingredients, it's actually high fructose corn syrup and wheat and dye that's been molded to look like a piece of bacon or a sausage. There's no meat in there. It's basically kind of fake food that's all been, you know, chemicals that's been put together to, you know, look like something great. It's full of sugar. And your pets say, oh, this is great. You know, they're feeding me a treat. But what we're doing is we're feeding a lot of carcinogenic substances. And the kibble industry, I go to the, the AFCO meetings. I know what actually goes into the kibble. I know what these companies are doing. Um, there are so many waste products from the human food industry that they've discovered, hey, this is a good place to put this. We'll put it in pet food instead of filling up our landfills. Now, while that sounds like a wonderful thing, an awful lot of the ingredients that are going into our pet food are things like spent distillers grains, um, recycled oils, um, things from the, the food industry that basically have had all the nutrition already taken out of them. And so they're just fillers and binders and not offering good nutrition to our pets. And frankly, an awful lot of it becomes carcinogenic. And the the dry kibble in particular uses a lot of rendered products. And the FDA just came out this past week with a statement that says, wow, we kind of think the pentobarbital problem in pet food is more rampant than we once thought. Really? Because we've been discovering pentobarbital in, in kibble and canned pet food since the 90s. Like they've known it was there. FDA is supposed to enforce the law that says that only animals that have died by slaughter can be used in pet food. However, they have clearly stated flat out on recording, nope, we're not gonna enforce that law. It's fine to use animals that have died otherwise than slaughter to be used in pet food. So that's all the diseased carcasses, the cancerous carcasses, the spoiled rotten meats. So they have no problem with spoiled rotten animal carcasses that have been sitting out in the sun decaying for weeks being used in pet food as long as it's cooked at high temperatures. Cooking it at high temperatures will destroy the bacteria, but it does not destroy the endotoxins that are released by the bacteria. It does not destroy the aflatoxins, which are the molds that are found on grain, moldy grain, which um, I get the grain reports and something like 80% of the corn in the US this year was affected by molds. So all those molds are not destroyed in the rendering and cooking process to make these foods. And those molds are very toxic for the dog and cat liver. 
So, and where do you think the good grain is going to the human food industry? So all that moldy grain, what are they doing with it? They're throwing it at the pet food industry. So, because they'll take it and they spray it with all kinds of antifungals and stuff. So then we've got all these chemicals in the food and those right. chemicals are not cooked out either. So I'm a huge fan of fresh food for me. I'm a huge fan of fresh food for my pets. I'm a huge fan of organic whenever you can do it, grass fed, pasture raised. Uh, glyphosate, which is Roundup basically is being found. I mean, pretty much anything you test, you're going to find it. And, um, our, our pets have a shorter lifespan. You know, their livers are working harder um, to, to process all this stuff. And so one of the things that I see most commonly in my practice when I run lab work is elevated liver enzymes. And so the first thing I want to do is say, okay, well, you know, what, what are you feeding? Let's change it and let's detox that liver. And it's amazing sometimes just going to a whole food diet, the, you know, the lab work suddenly is normal. Yeah, that's interesting. And I noticed this year too, I grew up in a farm and I, my, and seeing all of the herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, and rodenticides and all that stuff um, going on the, the fields, you know, and it, and then, and then getting corn like this year, we got, we picked up a lot of corn. I love corn in the cob with some lots of good butter and some, some sea salt. But then there was a couple times we leave the corn and then we go to that to eat it and and we have more often this year, there was like, it was mold. And I said to my wife, I'm like, even if the other cobs that were with that, you know, dozen that we bought that didn't have mold on, that just means that it hasn't showed its physical form or presence. And, you know, so it's still the, the, the essence of it is still there. It just hasn't yep. started to grow. Right. Yep. And then you eat that, you consume it. So it can be a, a vicious cycle. Right. Um, and then your liver just has to work to try to detox all of that. And, uh, yeah you know, it's just, yeah. it's more work than our body needs. We, we have enough trouble detoxing our environmental pollution. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, yeah. And that's why, um, so we, as you've been talking, the first presenter that comes to mind is Dr. Ruth Roberts with the, um, the original crock pet diet. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with her work? Yes. Yep. I interviewed yeah. her for my radio show a few weeks ago. Oh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Ruth is awesome. Um, and she, so, so that's into my, that's into my next question is, Listen, to you talk and then thinking, okay, if I'm Joe Blow or Jane Doe listing, I'm like, okay, this is cool, Barney. I'm sure, Dr. Judy, this sounds amazing and awesome, but I'm still thinking that, you know, real food's more expensive than regular pet food. Um, so can you enlighten us a little bit more on that? It really is not. So, uh, you know, I have this argument a lot. And I actually did a video where I went in the grocery store. And so the grocery store pet food is, is kind of the worst of the worst. Um, you know, if you want to find better pet food, please go find an independent small pet store because they're, they, first of all, they're more well educated than the big box stores. The employees care a lot more generally uh, about really educating themselves and learning and they can be a great source of information. Um, but I, I, have done a couple videos where I go into the grocery store and I just start picking up cans and boxes and bags and reading ingredients and kind of debunking, um, you know, that this one says it's holistic, natural, blah, blah, blah. And then you flip it over and read the ingredients and go, yeah, not so much. Um, but I did something where I was looking at the little, uh, tins of dog food, um, which have just horrendous ingredients. And when I figured it out, it was like $7 a pound that people are paying for this food. Now, nobody does that math. They're like, oh, I pay, you know, a buck for per can. And then they don't realize it's like three and a half ounces. So I went through and I did this and I said, okay, well, $7 a pound. Now let me go over to the meat section and the vegetable section, you know, the fresh foods. And let's see what we can buy for $7 a pound. What can I make for my pets? And let me tell you, I can make a really meat heavy, really healthy diet for an awful lot less. Now, if you are buying the bottom of the barrel kibble and you're spending, like I have clients that come in and they go, oh my gosh, that food was so expensive. It was $20 for the 50 pound bag. And I'm like, okay, we might have a little trouble with that one. Um, you know, but I have people who get really creative. Uh, a lot of clients have joined co-ops where they go together and they buy large batches of meats you can go to your butcher and you can say, I would like all the trimmings. I would like, you know, cause your dog doesn't have to have 
the filet mignon, the trimmings are fine. So let's go get the trimmings. Let's go get some of the leftovers. Um, you know, we do want to feed organ meats. So, you know, heart is wonderful. So a, a client was in yesterday and she's like, oh yeah, I go over to the, the there's a large place that's a meat processing uh, plant by us. And she said, I go over there and I buy beef heart and I buy five beef hearts at a time. Well, beef hearts like 60 pounds, 60 cents a pound. And then they split it up. So that counts as muscle meat. So what are you going to get for 60 cents a pound? You know, this is, this is good, wholesome stuff. And then, you know, you buy your veggies. We actually, uh, we uh, started raising chickens two years ago when we bought this house. We bought eight chickens and raised them up and we get eight eggs a day. And we did that because I wanted fresh eggs for my dogs and for us that are pasture raised, organic, like I know where those eggs come from. I'm not going to kill my chickens for the chicken, but I can get the eggs. Um, we have a vegetable garden and we raise vegetables for the dogs and for us. And, and we're, you know, it takes up a little tiny space. You can, you can raise things in a pot. Not everybody wants to go that far and do it, but you can go to a wholesale store and buy, you know, large bags of meat. Your dogs don't care. Most of them can eat meat that is 80% lean. So you don't have to be buying the 97% lean, the 96% lean, although some people do, particularly if they have dogs with pancreatitis problems and need a more lean meat. But if you're creative and you really want to do it, you can make your own food much cheaper than buying an already processed high quality food. So for instance, the, the only kibble, I don't like kibble at all, but there is only one on the market that I would ever consider feeding my dogs if I was pushed between a rock and a hard place. And I think a 22 pound bag is $105. So, you know, what am I going to do? Am I, I'd rather feed fresh food. So it doesn't have to be yeah. more expensive. You just have to get creative. Yeah. And I think, I think that at the surface, like the, the perception of it is that because of the food that we buy maybe for ourselves and the food wastage and the spoilage and stuff. I've actually been running numbers and keeping track. So don't tell my wife this, but um, <laughs> I've been keeping track about how much we eat out, how much uh, we have for food and then there's spoilage and then there's food that was in the freezer and it got freezer burnt and then stuff yep. that was in the cupboard in the pantry that, Oh, well now it's moldy or, or maybe not moldy, but it, it's stale or whatever. Um, and I was looking at actually just, I have a couple, we live in a very abundant um, rural community in, um, like farming community in Ontario. And um, anyways, and so I just looking at it, looking at the numbers and actually thinking that, you know what, finding somebody that can prepare hash, fresh whole foods um, to, for our family would actually be less expensive and all of the time and the cleanup and the prep and all that stuff, I'm factoring all that stuff in. Now this, you're probably thinking not only yourself, Dr. Judy, but everybody else listening saying, what the heck does this have to do with what you're talking about? But I feel like it's important because it's an element that I think it, it will disable people when not really understanding the numbers and then doing the math, like you said, to then and be able to embrace it, to really like, you know, to actually utilize it and actually see that it, it, I remember when Dr. Ruth was, I don't remember exactly how she stated it, but I remember the gist of it was that it actually is cheaper doing it the way that she suggests doing it with the crock pot diet. Um, sure. Uh, you know, if you consider the medical bills that you're going to save, that's mm -hmm. the first thing because right. we save a lot of that, you know, chronic disease, arthritis, inflammation. And, you know, I, I tell people all the time that, you know, so somebody will come in for a consultation with their dog that's had allergies and, you know, skin infections. Every time they stop the antibiotics, it comes right back. It comes right back. It comes right back. I'm like, well, okay. and, you know, and they say, well, okay, the food that you want me to feed is going to be more expensive if I buy it already prepared or, you know, I have to make it myself and maybe it's going to, you know, the perception is it's going to cost more. And I'm like, how much have you spent on antibiotics and vet visits and grooming visits for the medicated baths? how much have you spent this past year? Let's take that and put it into the food and you'll be amazed because it's going to end up being cheaper. So, right. I mean, obviously if you start them off on the right foot to begin with, hopefully you're avoiding those medical bills anyway. And there's a lot more that goes into chronic inflammation besides food. You know, we can talk forever about over vaccination and chemicals and, you know, all the other problems that our, our pets are being subjected to. Um, but food is, I mean, it's the foundation of life. It's still the most important thing. And when I first, um, when I first started dating my husband, 
oh my gosh, we're going back 10, 12 years ago. Um, <laughs> Uh, went to Texas for the first time to meet his family. And so we're in San Antonio and uh, we're in his uh, brother's kitchen. And I look over and they've got this young lab puppy who's like six months old bouncing around. And then they've got this 13 year old dog who is just decrepit and looks terrible. And they said, oh yeah, she's on her way out. She hasn't been eating, but you know, when I'm looking over and there's these bowls of dry kibble sitting around. And she hasn't been eating very well, and she's really arthritic. She's having trouble getting up and down, and, you know, we think that she's at the end of her life. And I said, well, you know, I'm pretty sure that we could make food for her that would increase her life expectancy and certainly increase her life quality. And they kind of looked at me like I had two heads. And remember, I just met these people like 10 minutes before this. And so they don't know me <laughs> And I said, she goes, well, I wouldn't know how to do that. I said, okay, open your freezer. What's in there? She goes, oh, I've been meaning to clean out the freezer. I said, great. Now's the moment. Now here we have this, you know, house full of people. Everybody's there meeting and greeting. And we've got, you know, all these guests and there's people and they're making a big meal for the people. And so I start whipping things out of her freezer. I'm like, oh, you want to get rid of this? You want to get rid of this? And I started, you know, I just literally threw all these things on their counter. And, you know, when we were done. She's like, oh, my freezer's nice and clean. And I said, good, we're going to make dog food. And so we made a couple of huge pots of stews for these dogs and she started feeding them to the dogs. And, you know, a month later I get this phone call and she says, you would not believe the change in this old dog. She's running. She comes running for her meals. She's playing. It's like her arthritis disappeared. This is amazing. And I said, mm-hmm. <laughs> and so she cooked for that dog for two more years. Wow. And, you know, so this was kind of, you know, early in my stage of doing all this. And so I didn't make sure that we had a complete and balanced diet. I was like, who cares? The dog is so much happier. Um, right. And, you know, that's a fallacy that everything has to be 100% complete and balanced every single meal. That well, myth is perpetuated by the pet food companies that want you to buy the food and the veterinarians who <laughs> want you to buy the food. <laughs> <laughs> Speak the truth, Dr. Judy. <laughs> There's that. And I was going to say that it's actually a flaw in the created universe, regardless of our religious or spiritual affiliation and or doctrine or creed or whatever we believe that there is never, um, when you look at something in balance, there's a constant flux and changing. That's why yeah. I, I was, one of my questions I was gonna ask you earlier was, uh, which you can come up now, was about the fact that there is purpose to the imbalance, um, to where the imbalance is to then maybe it's to you know, the, the pets don't know this or the dog or the animals don't know this, but it's to maybe let us know that something's out of balance. And if not, you know, if something's out of balance, it serves a purpose to bring the awareness to that and then fix it and bring it back into balance. But on the other hand, um, something that stays out of balance too long can create balance and and disease. Exactly. So if you think about um, your pet gets a bacterial infection, so the body says, oh my gosh, we need to make an inflammatory response. We need to send in white blood cells. We need to send in antibodies. We need to attack this. So the body will um, you know, increase the heat because that's going to kill off the bacteria. So the body will, you know, it will be out of balance because it had a foreign invader. It needs to create heat, generate inflammation to go attack that. And once it attacks it, then everything calms back down and it goes back into balance, you know, unless the, the animal just is not able to fight it off. And then that's when we jump in there. Um, the reason antibiotics work is that they're very cooling. They're energetically very cooling. So they help the animal feel better besides killing the bacteria. But unfortunately, they also kill the good bacteria. So there are times when being out of balance is appropriate. But like you said, when that imbalance stays and doesn't go back into balance, that's where life the problems goes awry. <laughs> right. Yeah. And um, yeah, no, that's really great. And I think it was awesome just going over the big, the big picture, but then getting into some of the nitty gritty de uh, details. Um, in, in looking at the, the whole foods and the importance of it and balancing it out. <clears throat> now there's some questions coming in um, that I want to pull up here. So the first one um, was from Sarah Jane was what, did, what would you say to a plant-based uh, only diet for dogs? Mine get beef heart, uh, lamb's liver, uh, yummy organ and tendon meat along with the seasonal vegetables and eggs with the membrane um, and shells. They are, they are thriving. So she's stating that, that she's doing that, but what are, what are your thoughts on a plant-only based diet for dogs? 
I am really against it. Uh, our dogs are not made to be vegetarians. Technically, they're omnivores, and they have the enzymes that they need to process plant foods. Right. Uh, but one of the problems that we see, um, and this has come to light recently, and the FDA actually is, quote, investigating. We'll see what happens. Right. Um, but a deficiency of taurine and carnitine, which are two amino acids that are found in meats, particularly high levels in heart muscle. Um, dogs don't make taurine and they, they don't make these amino acids well, and they don't make enough of them, um, of certain amino acids. And the same goes for kitty cats that they will go into heart failure if that is not supplemented. So those are not found in plants. So if you want to feed a plant-based diet, which I am totally against, uh, I will not treat cats that the owners insist on them being, being vegans because I know they're gonna die and I, I don't wanna be part of that. Um, but for the dogs, it's not their natural diet. It's not what they're meant to eat. Yes, they do eat some plant material. Um, you know, their ancestors ate, you know, kind of the leftovers that were thrown in the trash pile. Um, and they eat the stump, some of the stomach contents of their prey, which is pre-digested veg vegetable matter. But they're missing too many things. And so what ends up happening on a plant-based diet is you have to supplement all these things that are missing in that plant-based diet. And, you know, it's kind of like, do you want to, you know, I mean, literally we could survive on Cheerios. And this is kind of what we ask our pets to do. Um, here, here's a box of dry kibble that you can give to your kids each morning. It's got all the vitamins and minerals that are synthetic added into that to keep them alive and keep them quote, healthy. That's basically the same exact thing that kibble is. It's a denatured processed food that has all the life literally cooked to death out of it. And then it has a synthetic vitamin mineral supplement put in there. It makes absolutely no sense to us. And we, we, we laugh like it's funny if you think about feeding I'm... that dry box of kibble to your kids twice a day, <laughs> every day for the rest of their life. Yet that's exactly what we were asking what people to pets. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I, that's why I muted myself because I was, as you were saying that I was actually laughing, <laughs> Right. <laughs> which, you know, and the crazy part is that, is that it is just, has been something that has been promoted. Uh, like Sarah Jane mentioned earlier, just that they're, they're masters at marketing. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, and my experience, the more, not, not always, but sometimes the more inferior a product is the better and more clever uh, the marketing has to be. Oh, absolutely. Sell it, right? When it's really good. Um, so I'm humbly, as a, I use Young Living Essential Oils, I think they're amazing and awesome. They, I think that the quality sells themselves. I've used other oils. And as an example, in the fitness industry, you know, the people that are, the trainers and the coaches and the gyms that are really good, they don't have a problem uh, with the marketing or businesses in general. But the ones who are struggling, their marketing has to really, you know, make up for it to get it through. And so it just, yeah, proves the point. Right. And unfortunately, people, people are left not knowing what to do. You know, people right. listen, tune into me and, and listen. I do Facebook Live almost every day, you know, educational stuff. They read my blogs and, you know, they're on my website and they say, this is so confusing for me, you know, because I'll post a recall on something that's really popular that's, you know, everybody's been feeding and I thought right. I was the best. Now I'm so confused and I don't know what to do. Um, yeah. And it is very hard for the average consumer to weed through the advertising and actually figure out what's, what's going well, on. Well, yeah. And I think that's the responsibility that we have, um, you know, in, in health and vitality and health and wellness in human beings. It takes a lot of vitality to be a, a grounded, rational thinking human being, whereas our pets <laughs> and animals can only get what they've been given or if they're out, not they're in the wild, but when they're domesticated, they can only... I mean, for the most part, eat what we give them. Pretty so much. Us. Pretty and, much. Yeah. If my guys could figure out how to open the refrigerator themselves, they would, but they haven't figured yeah. it out yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never, you never know. So Sarah Jane said, thank you. That's what I believed. Uh, they needed meat protein, and yet there were some saying their digestive systems have adapted, um, but yet I'm, I am dubious. Yeah, they, they absolutely can digest grains and plant matter. Um, I don't use any starches or grains in my recipes for my own pets, um, but a lot of clients do, and some pets will do better. I mean, diabetic dogs, 
Um, I'm finding that if we put a little barley in there for the fiber source and it's low glycemic value and it's cooling and draining, it helps right. a lot of my diabetic patients stabilize. Um, but they're certainly going to get a lot of meat in that diet as well. <clears throat> well, and I'm, I don't know for sure. This would just be my, my presumption, but I'm willing to, to presume that the majority of people who are feeding their, their uh, animals uh, vegan or vegetarian they probably are themselves and that's their beliefs. Um, yeah. and, and it's not to say that it's wrong. You can do whatever you want. It's, you know, but on the other hand, you have to look at what's, what's working and what isn't. Right. And that's why I say, you know, I will not treat a, a vegan kitty cat. They just, I know they're going to die. I know they're going to die early. I know they're going to have overwhelming infections. They're going to die of heart disease. And I just can't be part of that. I, you know, I, and I talk to them blue in the face and some people just say, no, this is, you know, this is the way I'm going to do it. I can respect that, but I don't have to be a part of that. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I have a lot of okay. vegan clients who, you know, they put on their three pairs of gloves and their gas mask and their, you know, their aprons and they chop up organ meat for their dogs. So I respect <laughs> <that>. <laughs> Well, as uh, to each their own, everybody's got to find their own way. Um, so Tina has a question um, that is about, let me try and find it here. So my dog's vitamin D is elevated. Uh, 192 should be no higher than 150. I fed him Tolden raw uh, with no added supplements. I emailed Tolden and they asked their homeopathic vet and they said that they've never seen this uh, elevated vitamin D. Uh, wondering what would cause this elevate, elevated vitamin D um, as it uh, can be dangerous. <clears throat> His alt enzyme uh, was high, so he is on RX supplement that had uh, milk thistle and vitamin B in it, um, and it is still high, but came down to two to two fifteen. That seems like it's higher um, to two fifteen. But w would it be the food? Uh, I would like to stay with commercial raw. So. I don't know if that's sufficient information. Yeah, well, I'm not familiar with that particular brand of food, so I don't know exactly what they're putting in there. Uh, vitamin D is found in the highest quantities in egg yolks and fish. So I don't know if they're, you know, if any of that is in that particular food product. Um, and this could just be an idiosyncrasy for this dog. I don't think she's at a danger level where I would be really concerned. I mean, might be worth checking the dog's parathyroid uh, function to see if there's something going on there. Um, you know, and if there's a, there might be a calcium phosphorus imbalance in that food, uh, because vitamin D, calcium phosphorus all, you know, kind of play together, um, and interact with each other. So I might ask the pet food company, um, you know, to give me the stats on the calcium phosphorus uh, ratios and percentages in their foods that you're feeding. Um, I mean, you could switch to a different brand for six weeks and retest and see if that makes a difference right. uh, for the pet. In all honesty, most pet diets are low in vitamin D, and I find a lot more of my patients are too low. So to hear one that's too high is kind of interesting. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then um, she had said that she used, bought the natural oral drops. I don't know if this is related or not. Uh, I brushed my dog's teeth uh, every night with CET toothpaste. Can I use the Dr. Judy Morgan drops in place of CET? Oh, please do. The CET is filled with chemicals that are not good for your pet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, and for there, the drops, yeah. if you still want to brush, uh, the recommendation is mix a few drops with a little bit of coconut oil and use that on your toothbrush. It works really well and they like the flavor. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, there you have it, Tina. Hopefully that is a, a good answer. And Sarah Jane um, was asking just about that with the opinion and feeding plant-based diet. And I think Angela, I don't, I want to make sure I don't miss this. Um, just wondering, oh, Angela is wondering, just wondering when the companion book for cats is coming. <laughs> she doesn't love cats at all, but I think that if she did, then she would ask that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, kitty cats are a little trickier. And I mean, like, I have a cat right now with lung cancer. She'll be 19 in a, in a couple of months. And again, you know, she was just acting a little weird. So went in perfect lab work and popped an x-ray and went, huh, look at that. She's got an egg in her chest. Um, I am not treating my cat with anything herbal. Uh, 
cats are very difficult. Cats, you know, just try to shove something down their throat or put something in their bowl that they don't like. I'm having a hard enough time keeping this cat eating, so I can't adulterate anything. Um, one of my technicians is, we call her the food guru, and she has eight cats, and she home cooks for her cats, and they've adapted to it, and they eat pretty well. But kitty cats, you can make a pot of food for them, and getting them to eat it is going to be very tricky. Some cats are great, and they love homemade food, but the majority of them, they're so finicky, and they might eat it once, but I will tell you that cats do not like leftovers, so you just try to take that crock-potted meal, sorry, slow cooker meal, and serve it to them again tomorrow out of the refrigerator, even if you warm it up, they're going to go, yeah, no, I don't think so. So, uh, Cats are fussy. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're kind of a pain in the butt. Yeah. Um, so I cook meats for my cats. I cook eggs for my cats. Um, I'll offer them different things along with their raw food that they're eating. Um, but they're just really picky. So, yeah. that, you know, and I know there's more cat owners than dog owners in the world. And cat owners are asking me for this book all the time. And we actually started it a couple of years ago and it kind of got put on the back burner. Um, but cats just you know, they just don't go for it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Angela said, <laughs> Angela said she just makes very small batches because then yeah, you have to you don't make really small little batches and then you yeah. don't have to worry about them going to school. Yeah. No leftovers for kitties. They, there's yeah. no way. <laughs> That's not for them. The cats aren't down with, we, we call them planned overs because that way, whatever we don't eat, then we can freeze and eat the next time. <laughs> <There's>... <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, cool. So that was, Definite great expansion on um, just the T TCVM energetic for maximum health. Um, in regards to the, the food therapy for kidney disease in the last five minutes, we'll leave the, the dangle, the carrot here for people. Um, but um, that is, so just tell us a little bit more. That obviously goes into great detail, but. Yeah, so kidney disease is, uh, you know, chronic kidney disease is one of the biggest problems that we see in uh, clinical practice. Uh, particularly if your pets live long enough, the, the, uh, from a Chinese medicine standpoint, we are given enough kidney function people to live 100 years. We don't really know if you take good care of your body and eat right and keep everything in balance. And for animals, we don't know what that magic number is. Maybe it's 20, maybe it's 25. We don't usually get there because we do too many toxic things to them along the way. Um, but it is a, a big problem. And so one of the labs uh, recently came out with a new early detection test, which is making everybody crazy because if, they, if the veterinarians see you know, even one point elevation in that, they immediately want to prescribe a prescription um, kidney diet, which if we think about it, the kidneys are all about water and moisture. So any pet with kidney disease should never have dry kibble past their lips. And I don't care if it's a prescription diet. I don't care if it's a regular diet. Dry kibble makes no sense for them. It's a dehydrated product. Their body has to, you know, add the fluid back into it. I did the math once. And if you add about two gallons to every cup of kibble, you might get it back to where it started moisture wise. So your pet just can't get enough moisture in. So right. that's the first thing. Um, but so when we look at kidney disease from a TCBM standpoint, it has, uh, there's kidney yang deficiency, there's kidney yin deficiency, there's kidney chi deficiency. And we're going to feed different ingredients in the diet depending on which one of those we have. So the first thing that we want to figure out is, is the pet too hot or is the pet too cold? Um, you know, uh, arthritis is closely associated with kidney disease because the kidney element rules the bones as well and also the spinal cord and uh, brain. So um, all of that goes together. So we and it's also related to hearing. So we see a lot of these animals that are getting chronic kidney disease. They're also going deaf. They're weak in the hind end. Um, they're getting a lot of arthritis and all that goes together. So when we tweak the diet or totally change the diet um, to treat the kidney yang deficiency or the kidney yin deficiency or the chi deficiency, we will also help all of those other things that are part of that element. Hmm. <laughs> yeah that's um yeah no i was just i was taking some notes and then all and then i was like oh goodness i muted myself again and didn't unmute myself because <laughs> that, that happens from time to time um <clears throat> but yeah that is uh that's really good so that, i think that's going to be interesting so I'm, I'm excited because i have a feeling like you uh, have a little bit of experience and know what you're talking about um <laughs> and very passionate about it it's very clear and evident so 
first, um, just, well, not first, but I'd like to say thank you for your time today. Um, also for being involved with us here at the summit, because uh, just to uh, reiterate um, the purpose and the vision for the Animal Wellness Summit is to really bring uh, together uh, people like yourself as presenters with all of the brilliant wisdom that you have to share in a forum that can reach more and more people um, to help get better in touch and in tune because the, the holistic and balanced um, approach to caring for pets and animals uh, when you're into it and becoming more educated or you're an educator on your side, uh, Dr. Judy, it seems so basic and like common sense, but there, that's the minority. It's in the, it's a minority, right? There's oh, yeah. a lot of people that don't have any idea. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to hear in full your presentations and, um, uh, and everybody saying, everybody in the chat here is saying, thank you. Such a great mm -hmm. talk. Always learn a lot. So um, do you have any any closing words of wisdom that you would like to leave us with? Not that you didn't leave us. <laughs> um, never overlook the power of food. And if you're having problems with your pet, um, you know, there's always diet tweaks and, you know, whether it's herbs, food, um, supplements, things that can always be done that, I, you know, I never give up. Um, I, I deal with a lot of senior patients and to me, old age is not a disease. It's just a new set of challenges and I love a challenge. So, you know, I don't give up on these guys. You know, my, my 17 and 19 year olds with lung cancer, it's like, all right, well, fine. What are we doing today? You know, it's not, oh my gosh, they're going to die soon. It's, you know, okay, how do I, what do I do? You know? Um, so there's always something. Uh, and I would say, um, you know, for anybody who's more interested in learning about this stuff, go to my website, drjudymorgan.com. Tune in, Facebook Live, Judy Morgan DVM. Um, every morning, Eastern time, we're at eight during the week, generally, and nine on the weekends. Um, we don't miss too yes. often. Most days we're on. Um, and you'll just get a ton of information, out, you know, around the subject. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, yeah, and thank you for that. I was going to actually ask right at the end. So your website, again, Dr. Judy, it's dr. Judy, yeah. so J U D Y M O R G A N. Yep, Dr. Judy Morgan dot com. Okay, and then on Facebook, it's uh, Dr. Judy Morgan DVM. Okay, cool. Yeah, sorry, right. that I didn't make a match. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One was well, set up can... before the other, and it's yeah, it's it's the all the branding stuff that you don't think about when you first start out. You just exactly. create an account, right? <laughs> and so you're kind of you're kind of stuck with it. So uh, yeah. my Instagram is Dr. Judy Morgan, so that's a little easier. <laughs> okay. No, that's amazing. So yeah, and then your book. So can people find your books on drjudymorgan.com? Yes, they're on my website and they're also on Amazon. So pretty okay, cool. easy to get a hold of. Awesome. Okay, well, that is uh, it for today. So thanks for tuning in, everybody who is here live. Um, and just a reminder for those of you VIPs, you get your chance to come on live and ask your questions because, I mean, getting a little bit of insight as Tina did and even answering some of the questions, Dr. Judy, that it's it's very helpful and it's also great for you to spread the good word about all the work that you do um, and empowering for everybody who's able to tune in. And um, for those of you who are listening to the replay, uh, just know that these are all stored on our, um, uh, the website and also on our YouTube channel soon um, and on Facebook. And as a reminder, just because of the timing, um, the dates for the Animal Wellness Summit have changed. Uh, oh. Originally, originally they were, this has been, sent out Dr. Drew's like, oh, well, that's good to know. I'm a, I'm a presenter. Um, but it literally was just fresh this week. Uh, we posted in the Facebook group. So I'll we'll have to make sure we get you in the Facebook group. But uh, the summit is now on November 17th until the 26th, 2018. That's the second animal summit, animal wellness summit. And um, it originally was the first to the 10th, uh, but we have another event in it was originally the first to the 10th of November, but we have another event in October that we needed some more time to prepare and then just for other things. So we can, we're still going to have a great, amazing show this year. So we have some pretty great things we've been working on. So great. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thanks uh, for tuning in. We'll see you on the next call.